The Four Noble Truths have often been compared to the way a physician might treat a disease. The comparison is a good one. The Buddha thought of himself more as a healer with specific remedies for specific problems than as a philosopher concerned about metaphysical questions. In the First Noble Truth, the Buddha determines the disease and its symptoms. In the Second Truth, He provides an etiology, a description of the cause of the disease. Once the source of the disease has been understood, he can say whether or not it can be treated. And in the third, he proclaims that, indeed, a cure is possible. Finally, in the fourth noble truth, he offers a prescription, a regimen for treating the ailment and curing the patient. In the First Noble Truth, the Buddha identified the disease as dukkha, manifesting as a wide range of human experiences, from the ordinary events of getting sick, getting old, and dying, to not getting what we want and getting what we don't want. The Buddha also suggested that dukkha manifests not only in particular experiences, but in the whole of existence. Recognizing dukkha on this level, however, requires persistent and attentive awareness. In the second noble truth, the Buddha declares that the root of dukkha is desire or craving. He tells the five monks, Now this, bhikkhus, is the noble truth of the origin of suffering. It is this craving which leads to rebirth accompanied by delight and lust, seeking delight here and there. That is, craving for sensual pleasures, craving for becoming, craving for disbecoming. Well, this very compact statement will require a good bit of elaboration, but it's important that we do so because the second truth is really at the heart of the Buddha's vision and it's the aspect of his teaching that distinguishes it most from other religious perspectives. Let's begin with this word craving, since he connects it so closely to the experience of suffering. Knowing the Pali term will help. That word is tanha, which generally translates desire, but it carries an even richer significance when we realize its literal meaning is thirst. In this context, of course, thirst is meant metaphorically to denote certain qualities in the experience of desire. Thirst conveys an intensity that the word desire does not always express. Desire can range in meaning from a simple wish to raging lust. The meaning of thirst, however, is more limited because water is essential to our lives. Thirst connotes urgency and necessity. I can desire a double latte for my mid-morning coffee break, but it might not be available and it's no big deal if it's not. I'll get something else or go without. On the other hand, if I'm very thirsty, that I drink and what I drink become matters of great importance. Thirst suggests that I require something very specific and immediate. I can even experience thirst as a concern of life and death. Yet the difference between desire as wish and desire as thirst is really only a matter of degree. A desire first conceived as a faint hope can easily and imperceptibly take on the quality of intense craving. It is possible for my love of lattes to become a habit and then a compulsion. There are two aspects of the concept of tanha that will help us grasp the significance of it in the Buddhist thought. First is the nature of the experience that arises out of it. Second is the prior states of being that foster thirst 
in the first place. Exploring the first aspect helps to explain why Tanha makes us prone to suffer. And the second helps us to understand how to alleviate it. Let's start with a basic question. Why is the Buddha so down on desire? I mean, what's wrong? It's such a natural human experience. Well, the answer is nothing really. I mean, there's nothing wrong with wishing and wanting per se. The problem arises when desires are self-centered and take on the intensity of craving. At that point, what begins as an object of wishing becomes a matter of necessity. We confuse want and need. Our beliefs about the world and ourselves convince us that this item, whatever it is, is something we must have. I must have this job. I must win this award. I must marry this person. These beliefs might even make us think that our well-being depends on acquiring or doing this or that thing. Or it may be that this item is something that we already possess and that losing it would be devastating to our existence. And hence we hold on to it with white-knuckled grips. What was once mere wish has now become thirst and our relationship to what we want or to what we have is now attachment. Attachment or clinging is an important concept in both Buddhism and Hinduism. Both traditions recognize attachment as part of the driving mechanism of samsara and as a source of suffering. Attachment essentially refers to the nature of the relationship that we have to things. And by things, the Buddha meant not only material objects, but people, values, beliefs, ideas, power, status, experience, and sensations as well. Although the Buddha does not say so explicitly in the first discourse, Anything can become the object of attachment, including, as he well knew, his own teachings. The problem the Buddha saw was not with the objects of attachment, but with the nature of our relationship to them. Perhaps a good modern word to help us grasp the idea of attachment is addiction. In a very simple sense, addiction is a situation in which our mind and body convince us that we cannot live without a certain thing that we really don't need. I was once addicted to nasal spray. I didn't even realize that one could get addicted to nasal spray until one day, while living in Boston, I ran out of the stuff after using it for about two weeks. My sinuses began to swell, and I thought I might suffocate. I panicked. I frantically got into the car and drove like a maniac to the nearest pharmacy. Fortunately, it was Boston where reckless driving is the norm. I rushed in. I found the drug of my choice and ran to the cashier and plopped down my money. Without even waiting for change, I ripped open the box and took several deep snorts. Oh, blessed relief. My life was saved. And I realized that I had become an addict. I believed that having a particular thing was essential to my well-being. And the truth was, of course, that I really did not need the nasal spray. In fact, the spray was the problem. My breathing passages were getting stuffy, not because I was sick, but because they had become conditioned to the spray. I also observed how imperceptibly my appropriate use 